Okay, well, welcome to this Tuesday, 10th of Tavis, Fast Day 2023. How do you like my little uh, chullant of words over there? Today is the 10th of Tavis. We're fasting for three different reasons, namely three different reasons. Um, the fast wasn't always on the 10th of Tavis, actually. it was There was a fast on the 8th, and there was a fast on the 9th, and then they made a fast on the 10th, and then there was a fast on the 10th. And then they decided, hey, let's three days of fasting is inappropriate. So we're going to make it all in one day. But why are we fasting? So the first thing that happened in 425 BCE, perhaps, approximately, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Melech Bavel, the king of Babylonia, came, he was trying to conquer the world, came over to Jerusalem, wanted to conquer Jerusalem. Jerusalem was surrounded by a wall. He laid siege. He couldn't get inside for about two years until he was finally able to penetrate through the wall. And about two and a half years later, after the siege, the uh, was the ninth of Av, which was when the first base of Mikdash, the first temple, was destroyed. Um, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he wasn't king for so long after that, because the Persian Empire took him over. And in between the destruction of the first temple and the second temple were 70 years, and that's when the story of Purim took place. And that leads us into Ezra. Ezra was also there during that period of time. He was there at the end, more or less. Uh, he knew Mordechai and, and Esther. He rallied, he tried to rally the troops back from Babylonia, or sorry, from, yeah, Babylonia, from Persia, from Iraq, Iran, really Iran. The Jews have been living in Iran since the destruction of the first temple until the Shah was taken over right, in 1979. So just interestingly enough that Jews have been living there for a very long time. Um, so just really quickly, the reason why we celebrate or why we commemorate the siege is because that was that's considered the beginning of the end. That siege was considered the beginning of the end that ultimately led to this, ex this gullus, this exile that we've been in really since the first temple. Now, we know there's the, the Romans came and that, was, that really sealed the deal. But most Jews did not go back with Ezra to the land of Israel. Once we were, yeah, the, the temple was destroyed. Seven years in Purim, seven years, Purim story. Ezra was able to rally like 30,000 Jews. Not very much, not very many millions stayed behind. Uh, they, whatever, they integrated, they intermarried, they, life, society was good. Um, like most stories, um, funny enough, like in Hanukkah and in Purim, uh, the ending is not actually so great. Um, like the, the episode that happened is miraculous, but then life kind of went on as usual. Just an interesting note. We give credit where credit's due. So, uh, but even though afterwards things didn't really pan out so well. Anyway, Ezra came and uh, he, uh, he was able to make things happen. Uh, Jews came. He passed away. Wait, 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 sorry. Why was Ezra so famous? Ezra really was a true leader. He was able to get people to marry within the faith. Uh, he did a revival of Jewish education. Uh, he formulated the Siddur, the Siddur that we have, the prayer book that we use. That was first introduced by Ezra. The knowledge that we had when we left um, it, Babylonia, the Jews were in a very poor state of knowledge and observance. We didn't even know what Chana, we didn't even know what Rosh Hashanah was about. He had to teach us him and Nehemiah, these other prophets. They taught us what really Rosh Hashanah was about. We totally forgot a day of judgment, a day of crowning Hashem king. What was that all about? We didn't know. Anyway, he passed away around 200 BCE, 280 BCE. So about 200 years later, after the siege of the of the first temple so that was that happened on the eighth uh, on the eighth of up and another 200 years later the greek empire took over and this time the egyptian greek king ptolemy he wanted to, to hellenize the jews this was the beginning of the hellenist movement so to speak where it was very secular judaism greek judaism and there wasn't really nothing jewish about it except they were jewish people um and he ordered the 70 sages to translate the Torah into Greek. And it was a very sad, why was it so sad? Because 
they um, this was the precursor. This was the um, the first introduction of the Old Testament is going to be based off of this translation. So the Old Testament in the Christian Bible is based off of this translation, um, which is not it wasn't a totally accurate translation. Uh, there were 13 places where they had to make it inaccurate. And miraculously, all 70 of them translated the Torah into Greek exactly the same way. Um, and so, and there was the beginning, it was like a way to start Hellenizing the Jews and people really bought in and they took the divinity out of, uh, out of the Torah and they looked at it as an intellectual exercise. So it was a great darkness that happened on the ninth of Tavis. So on the eighth, Ezra passed away on the eighth, Ezra passed away. Yeah. On the ninth, the Torah was translated into Greek. Actually, I think the Torah was translated Greek on the eighth. I'm sorry. Ezra passed away on the ninth and, uh, the siege happened on the 10th. And uh, at some point in time, I don't exactly know when, they decided to limit the fast day only to the tenth of uh, the tenth of Tavis, which is today. Uh, this it's not a very severe fast. If you're weak, if you're pregnant, if you're yeah sick in any way, you don't have to fast. However, there is a halacha. Interestingly enough, you have to fast on a Friday, even if it leads into Shabbos. And the reason why that's significant is there's a halacha that you're not allowed to fast on Friday. I don't know if you, you can't go into Shabbos very hungry. Now, you should limit the amount of food that you eat. If you look in Shulchan Aruch, it talks about you should be hungry for Shabbos. It shouldn't be such an issue. But you're not allowed to fast going into Shabbos. But in this case, on the Sarah Tavis, you would have to fast. If it fell on a Friday, which it could, uh, which it could, could it? I don't think it can. Uh, but nor, but you, you would, you would fast on a Friday. Um, I don't think it can. I don't think according to our calendar it can. So that is today. Uh, it says that there descended a three days of darkness uh, when the Torah was translated to Greek. Um, the rabbi, Eli Melech, spoke about on Shabbos that he read at some point about some non-Jewish scientist that proved he had no agenda to prove anything in Torah, but he proved at that period of time there really was three days of darkness. So sometimes when we the Torah you know, is like a little bit... Um, it embellishes. There's a. It's called guzma. It like they uh, whatever. We can't always take things so literally. So we weren't sure. Not sure if it really had three days of darkness. It was figuratively or or literally. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it seems to be that it did. That's today. It's a fast day. It's a short fast day. If you live in the northern hemisphere, like we spoke about yesterday, um, here it ends at about I don't know five forty five forty five in the afternoon. I was able to wake up this morning. I had eggs and coffee. Um, with my son, it was uh, it was not so bad. I'm very hungry right now, though. I don't usually get so with hungry. With or without, with or without I, salt. Uh, well, I wasn't hard boiled <laughs> eggs. It wasn't hard boiled eggs, and it was without salt. Without salt, I probably should have had it with salt, but I had it without salt. Um. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the parsha. Good question, Uh Move on to the parsha a little bit over here. Just something that I um something I learn with people in the morning, right after davening, and just unrelated to anything. There was a, he, the person that I learned with asked me a question. He said, is it true that there's a mitzvah to not ever um, let a evid kanani, a non-Jewish servant, free? And I was like, I'm not sure. I don't think that's true. And then I, we looked it up and it was, in fact, it was true. So I was like, oh, wow, that's very interesting. And he's like, I have a problem with it. You know, the, obviously it's like, it's a little uncomfortable. But it actually says, the, the halacha soon after that, that says, um, if an Evid Kanani, if a non-Jewish servant does not want to do mitzvahs, you have to let him go free. So clearly a non-Jewish servant wants to remain a non-Jewish servant. Uh, unrelated to anything. I just, I only learn this halacha once a year when I do the Rambam, when the Rambam gets to that place and I totally, I didn't know, I forgot about. I just thought I'd spent, mentioned that. Okay, so this week's Parsha, Parsha Zvayichi. And it's the, everyone's going to pass away in this week's parsha, except for uh, Yocheved, really, Moshe, Moses' mother. Oh, uh, by the way, this, I just want to mention that this class is in memory of Miriam Bas Antoinette, Margot Shulman, who's the grandmother of, um, of, um, of uh, Bella, so one of our, one of our star students. Um, so her name is and Aliyah, and uh, we should learn in her schos. And, uh, the, the name of the Parsha is Vayechi, and they lived on, and he lived, even though he passes away, because true life, true life is not whether your soul is in your body, 
the soul always, always lives on, but it's whatever you're trying to affect upon the world. If that continues, then you continue to live on. So um, that's a very nice uh, connection, I think, to her uh, to her grandmother. So in this week's parsha, everybody passes away. <laughs> um, but it says that Yaakov lived uh, the last 17 years of his life. He was sick. He was the first person that, that passed away who was sick. He passed away while, as a sick person. I don't think we ever had that before, at least not mentioned in the Torah. But it says the last 17 years of his life were 17 is the gematria, the numerical value of Tov. And if you follow the, uh, yeah, if you like gematria, numerical numbers, the uh, the the uh, the Turim, who wrote the Sefer, who wrote this book when he was 18 or 17, 18 years old, it became the Rav that it proved that he was able to come. He wrote it in one night. He was able to come Rav of the city of, uh, of um, no, not Warsaw, but the other one. What's the other city in Poland? I was there, Krakow which was a big, major Jewish place. So he says the last 17 years of his life uh, were his best years, the Tov, the greatest years of his life. And the question is, how could it possibly be that he lived in Egypt um, the last, and he knew what was going to happen. He knew that it was about to become enslavement and, and et cetera, et cetera. How could they be such good years? Better than living in the land of Israel? And it says, yeah, because he was able to create a Torah environment. He, remember, he sent his son Yehuda ahead of him, who set up yeshiva in Goshen, which was the town that they lived in, the suburb, the wealthy aristocratic suburb that they lived in. Um, and those were the best 17 years of his life. And what's going to happen is Yaakov, like all of our other patriarchs um, and Moses himself, he's going to give blessings to each one of his children. And they're usually not very nice blessings. <laughs> so he, he admonishes Reuven, Shim, and Levi, the first three. He gives them harsh yeah Reuven you didn't stick up you didn't do what you were supposed to do to protect your brother uh and also what you did with uh moving my bed remember he wanted his father to spend the night with his mother but it wasn't um he, but what I'm sorry what happened after Rachel passed away very quickly Rachel passed away and um so naturally you would think Ru uh Yaakov would spend more time with Leah but he didn't he went to the maid servant what was it? He went to Bila, the maidservant of Rachel, and um, moved his bed into there. And he was, Reuven was so offended. He's like, what do you mean my, my mother? Like, you just let my mother stand on the side. And the answer was, you have to understand who Rachel was, and she's just an extension of Rachel. And Rachel's going to play, play a role in here. Anyway, so he admonishes him for doing that, but he gives him a good blessing as well. Um, but Reuven and Shimon, he gives a really, uh, Shimon and Levi, he gives a tough a very gives them some kind of like curses almost. Um, and the reason is because of what they did in Shechem. They're very like hot-headed, even though they were young teenagers. Um, and Levi takes it to heart. Levi really changes himself um, from this blessing or what his father said on his deathbed. And he changes himself and he becomes very strong. He uses that strength to stand up for what's right and stand close to Torah. And the tribe of Levi was not affected whatsoever during the um, enslavement. They re remained in Goshen and they remained Torah tr true scholars. Um, and they we ended up becoming the tribe, of, they became Levites and Kohanim. They became the leaders of the Jewish people, the holy people, the holy Jewish people, showing here that a person can change. A person can change. Take criticism in the right way um, and great things will happen. Uh, one of my most, one of, one of my most favorite one of my favorite lines of all time is in this uh, in this in this episode of when Yaakov is sitting there and he's giving blessings and he's telling stories um, of his life. He looks at Yosef and he's always, he says, "Loi palalti es panecha kol yeme loi loi palalti rei panecha." I don't know exactly how. Yeah, ves panecha loi palalti vehine iriachi. Yeah, but here you are. Okay, <laughs> I don't exactly know the line by heart, but there's a specific learn specific word that I want to point out, palalti, he says, I never, he says, I never imagined palalti, I never imagined, loy palalti, I never imagined that re'i espanecha, that I would see your face again. I never imagined that I can actually see your face, and here you are. Now, palalti comes from the same word as tefillah. Tefillah is davening, connection, which is connected to Ezra, um, who set up the sitter. The idea of davening is that you envision where you want to go. You envision a chazin, the leader of the congregation is called a chazan because it comes from the word chazon, which means to see, to envision. 
Um, this is where we actually have the first introduction of that word, that the idea of davening is to where do I want to bring myself? How do I want to change? And where am I trying to go? Where am I? I'm trying to become the best version of myself. That is that is davening. And you ask Hashem to help you get there. And you need all your physical um, and spiritual needs met in order for you to get there, in order for you to become the best version of yourself. We don't ask for money, so to speak, just for the sake of having a lot of money. We don't ask for clothes just to like look fancy and whatever. No, it's in, in order to help my service of Hashem. What I ultimately, who the best version of myself that I want to become, which is a servant of Hashem, in touch with my true essence. So here we go. Palalti, imagine, vision, um, and tefillah. Um, Yaakov asks Yosef to please bury him. Please bury me in Eretz Yisrael. I know it's going to be very tough for you. Why is it going to be very tough for uh for, for Yosef to bury his father. He's the viceroy of Egypt. So it seems that there was like, um, Kumar talks about, wasn't so, um, there was like, always an advantage, there was always like this, uh, people were trying to take over the position. Yeah, people, they would try to stop him from being able to come back into the land of Egypt. If Yosef left, he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to get back in. And there would be a coup, and um, that would be the end of his, uh, whatever, he'd be left penniless, and, 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 Everyone who relied upon him would be destitute. But nevertheless, he promised his father because his father said his father made him promise. And his father at the same time apologized for what he did with his mother. Um, but he explained what, what happened. He buried her in Shechem. Rachel is not buried in Maras Machpelah, in Hebron. She's the only one that's not buried there. She's buried in Shechem. He could have easily buried her in Hebron. Why did he wait till, why didn't he bring her? Because Hashem, he said, Hashem told me to bury her in Shechem. Because connected to this week's parsha, uh, connected to today as well, another connection to today, it says that uh, Hashem told Yaakov there's going to come a time where there's going to be an exile, and it's the Babylonian exile, where the Jewish people are going to leave um, Eretz Yisrael and they're going to pass through Shechem, the city of Shechem. They're going to walk. They're going to go past Rachel's caver um, in order to get to Iraq and Iran, where they're going to be taken to. And it says, Rachel, there's a voice on, on high, and Rachel weeps for her children. And, when it, and she's interceding on the behalf. The reason why she's buried there is because she's sweetening the, the, the judgment, the gevuros. This is a very common theme, idea in Torah. Sweetening of the severity. And she's going to, she's going to pray on the behalf of the Jewish people and say, God, look, why are you doing this to my children? I had sacrifice. I had compassion for my sister, even though I didn't have to. True compassion. Even though perhaps she wasn't deserving for any reason, but I gave up my, you know, I could have had everything. But I gave up my sister. I want you to do the same. And God really appreciates that. And he sweetened the severity um, that ultimately we weren't like enslaved in, in Iraq, um, in Babylonia. We actually prospered very well eventually. Once uh, Darius took over, or Achashverosh took over, I should say. Um, Yaakov comes to bless Menashe and Ephraim. So he tells Yosef, Yosef is on his own tribe. Why isn't he? Why? Because a lot of weird guys that come from Yosef. <laughs> uh, Yeravim ben Nevat and Achav, some really bad kings. Um, so he's like, I got to like split it up over here. I got to like, you know, you're going to have too much, uh, too much. You're going to cause too much. Your project, you're going to cause too much pain to the Jewish people. So I got to, uh, let's, let's, let's split it up in half. Let's have some good people and some bad people and uh, it won't be attributed just to you. So um, Ephraim is the younger child and uh, Manasseh is the older, obviously. So Yosef brings his children, Ephraim and Manasseh, to be blessed by Yaakov. And so he places Ephraim on the right side of, his, of Yaakov. It's a very famous story, very famous and uh, Ephraim is on the left side. I'm sorry, Menashe is on the left side. No, the opposite. I'm sorry, the opposite. Really, he sh Yaakov should have been able to put his right hand straight onto the older one, Menashe, and his left one onto Ephraim. But what happened was Yaakov switched hands. And Yaakov was blind at this period of time. He switched his hands. Um, and he put his right hand onto the younger son, Ephraim, and his left onto Menashe. And Yosef said, oh, you got, you got it all mixed up, Pops. He goes, no, 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 I didn't get it mixed up. The younger one will become a greater, will become greater than the older one. And who comes from Ephraim? 
Yeshua, Joshua, the only one to lead, the, the one that actually led the Jewish people into the land of Israel. He came from, he needed an extra blessing in order to be able to, be able to overcome the tests of being, you know, part of the spies. That's ultimately going to lead to, uh, yeah, we know the story. And when we get there, we'll get there in a few weeks, um, well, a couple of months, actually. Um, this is Parshish Chazak. Yeah, okay, so we have a whole nother Chumash to go through. Vayikra, and then we'll get into Bad Midbar. Um, yeah, so Ephraim becomes a, becomes a greater nation than, than, uh, than Menashe does. Um, and uh, yeah, fine. He's like, fine. And he gives, them, he gives them a blessing. You should become like fish. Fish in the, we, we're always into fish. We love fish. Fish, actually, halakhically, is the best way to fulfill your obligation of uh, honoring Shabbos um, more than meat. Meat brings joy. But there's something very holy about fish. It says that tzaddikim, they come back as fish. Yeah, tzaddikim, when they pass away, they become fish. That's what it says. Um, it should be like fish. Why fish? Because fish have no ayin hara that looks upon them. Their eyes never close. It shows that the, there's never an ayin hara, a, a bad eye upon them. Nothing bad happens to fish. They, they survive the flood. No problem. They didn't even know the flood was going on, probably. And... They live in water. They they can only survive within water, just like we can only survive with Torah. Torah is compared to water, um, so it's a very holy. Uh, we like to be compared to fish. We like to we like to look like fish, act like fish. Um, this is, by the way, the first instance where we see right has preference over the left, and we do think we always we always give preferential treatment to the right hand or the right side more than the left. We put our Shoes on the right shoe on first. We put our arms through our clothes first. Um, there was a big, uh, what's his name? Uh, who passed away? Uh, what was the big goggle who just passed away? He said, um, when you put on your mask during COVID, you should start with the right side and then move to the left side. That's what he said. Um, so this is the first instance that we have right over left. Now there are times when, if you're a lefty, there are certain instances where you will do left over right. I don't know them. I'm not a lefty. My son is a lefty, it seems. So I will probably have to know them. But for now, he doesn't really listen to me. So I don't have to tell him. I don't have to know. Um, now, sorry, going back. Um, I mentioned the thing about Yosef will put his eyes. I may mention this, yeah? I'll, I'll just I'm gonna mention it again. It's from last week's Parsha, but it's very, it's very interesting. Yosef, Yaakov, when Hashem... When Yaakov found out Yosef was still alive, so the first thing he did, he was he got very nervous, and he's like, "Well, you know, who I'm, who's going to bury me in uh, back in Eretz Yisrael?" And Hashem responded to him, "Don't worry, Yosef will be the one that closes your eyes." Oh, we spent, I think I mentioned this last week, but it's worth mentioning again. It's very important. Uh, he says, uh, "Yosef will be the one. Yosef will close your eyes." Why? What does that mean? Yosef will close your eyes. So. When a person passes away, they're given a vision of Hashem right before they pass. Then the soul leaves the neshama, and the eyes must be closed. But we want to, the, the eyes are very holy at that point in time. So we want to quickly um, preserve that holiness. And the way you preserve that holiness, the, the physical holiness of the eye that just experienced Hashem, is by burying it, by putting dirt. So we put dirt on it right away. So he said, Yosef will be the one that puts dirt on, the, on your eyes. At the end of the parsha. Um, at the end of the parsha, there's going to be the burial of Yaakov. There's going to be burial of everybody. But there's a very famous medrash, which I know I've mentioned, about the burial of Yaakov. Asaph shows up. All everybody comes, kings come, everybody mourns Yaakov. Everybody understands that all the blessings. Yaakov gave a blessing to Pharaoh. Yeah, that the water, the Nile River, should rise when you come into it. That's very significant because before they had to build irrigation systems. There's no rain in Egypt, I guess, and there was irrigation systems. Um, but what was interesting is that whenever Pharaoh would walk, the, the blessing that Yaakov gave, that he should rise, whenever Pharaoh would walk into the Nile River, the water would rise up and would everybody's crops would become watered. Later on, he's going to say that I'm a god because the Nile was considered like a god, a deity, and because um, it it was a source of everything, like we like uh, we spoke about just in the beginning, that water is the source of all life and everything. Um, and here, here is Pharaoh having control over the water. And um, 
he saw it once everyone was dead, you know, once everybody passed, even Yosef, uh, the last one to pass away. No, Yosef was the first one to pass away. Um, been, um, whatever. Once all the children were, had passed away, um, Pharaoh said, okay, I'm, I, I have control over the water. I have control over this God, this deity, and uh, worship me, which people did, except for the Jews, which made him mad. Um, oh, so, so Yaakov... Everybody knew that this blessing at that period of time it came from Yaakov. So everybody saw the greatness of Yaakov. They so he said his the mourning period was incredible. Millions of people mourned him. Um, most notably, Asaph. Asaph came to bury his brother. He still wasn't such a nice guy. They make it to the Mars Machpelah. They make it to the cave in Hebron, and um, there was something that he wanted buried with. Uh, I forgot exactly what it was. He, there was something that he wanted buried with uh, his brother and there was a big argument and then they have to like go run back to get it whatever he forgot something uh, and it was making everybody mad because he was holding up a the levite it was holding up the burial process and um don has a son only one child and his name is cherish and cherish was he had special needs and he was he was also deaf and um he saw that his father was getting very angry with asaph because asaph was holding up this um procession and it's a front i mean it's a the greatest mitzvah you could possibly do is bury somebody and we're, we take it very seriously and we're very serious about it and there's no like hiccups and there's no what that and he sees that here's this guy asa who everybody knew nobody liked he's just a nasty person um uh, is like causing a problem and he the argue there's like an argument taking place but he can't hear exactly what's going on so finally he decides to end it and he takes out a sword, he chops off Asaph's head. Asaph's head rolls into the um he merited to have his head buried in Mars Machpelah. He was not supposed to be buried in Mars Machpelah in the cave because he gave up his birthright to his brother. Um, so his body's buried outside of the cave. Um, if you ever go to Hebron, everyone always like points, oh, I think he's buried over there, whatever. Um, it's like a big joke. But his head is buried in the Mars Machpelah. Um, Cherish went on to, um, even though he was an only child, when, they, when the Jewish people go into the land of Israel and the land becomes divided up, um, the tribe of Don, in the beginning, which had the least number, yeah, Don himself only had one child. Um, when they go into the land of Israel, Don will have the most number of children. Obviously, the, the lesson is, which we've spoken about before, is that the Torah is trying to tell you that someone with special needs doesn't mean they can't uh, grow and become a great nation. Um, you know, don't, it's all about how you treat that person and how they look at themselves. If they look at themselves like a normal, you know, as a, I'm a person with special needs, then that's really what they are. They're still a person and they can still grow and, and do, accomplish even more and be even greater than everybody else. Um, we see that, uh, just to mention over here, um, when, when Yaakov, Oh, when Rachel, this is the source, by the way, the earliest one, of the, this is the earliest source of going to a gravesite and um, receiving blessings and having the person who, the one who's passed intercede on your behalf. We know that there's five levels of the soul, nefesh, ruch, neshama, chaya, and then a Jew has a yechida. Um, the nefesh is the part that enlivens the body and the nefesh, that part of the soul, the lowest level of soul, the one that you and I interact with, with each other most often, uh, remains with the body and is connect, remains connected to the other four parts of the soul. Um, so wherever the soul is and whatever, you know, with how deep it is within Hashem's being, um, it can connect and you can communicate and it actually can, the soul can accomplish more for you after it's passed because it's not limited by the body than it can while it's um, in the body. Um, then that's the end of the parsha. It's uh, we have a very famous line over here. We have Hamalach Gelo Simi Kol Ra that the the angel Yaakov gives the uh, blessings to to Ephraim and Menashe that the the angel that protects um, all the children from bad should continue to protect you. It's a very famous uh, it's a very famous line that uh, we sing on Simchas Torah. By uh, when the children get an aliyah, all the children get an aliyah called Chol Na'arim. All of the children, they get an aliyah. And we sing it. A lot of people have the custom to sing it after Shabbos. 
Uh, it's like a very famous, very famous song. Uh, and then we end off the parsha with Chazak, Chazak Menis Chazak, because it's the end of the book of Bereshis, Genesis, which is a big deal. And we move right on into, we become slaves. We're going to be slaves for a little while. And we're, don't worry, we're going to come back out. Does anybody have any questions? We'll stop here. Good. I'm glad. Just kidding. Okay. If you have any questions, um, Rabbi Weinberg is just, he's getting, he was at the doctor's again. On Tuesdays, he has a meeting. So I'm trying to figure out a better time for him to give a class. So we'll get back to Tanya, no problem. Just don't know when, if it's later today or if it'll be tomorrow. But if uh, you have no other questions, I'm going to go. And uh, we will hopefully see you guys later. Have an easy fast for those that are fasting. Well, thank, thank you, Rabbi. You Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, Omar, good to see you, man.